The Dallas Mavericks are officially one win away from reaching the NBA Finals in a magnificent win against the Minnesota Timberwolves here in Game 3. Um, 116 and 107, a nine-point win. First thing is I want to address. A lot of these talking heads, a lot of these shows tomorrow on Monday, they're going to do a lot of talking about the epic performance from Kyrie and Luka Doncic from an offensive standpoint, 33 points apiece. Um, they outscored the Minnesota Timberwolves alone by themselves, 21 to 20 in that fourth quarter to wrap things up. Clutch shots. Kyrie in that fourth quarter was magnificent. Luka Doncic throughout the entire course of the game made timely basket after basket. Timely shots. But the thing that I think can't get lost in all of this is the defense that the Dallas Mavericks played within this game. They played incredible defense throughout the playoffs for sure. But to me, that fourth quarter, the defensive performance that they just put on was absolutely magnificent. There were so many possessions, even when Minnesota scored, where Dallas gapped up again. They made those dudes move the basketball. They cut off a lot of drives and a lot of lanes and at different angles. And they forced these dudes to use a lot of clock and end up with shots that they did not want. There were a couple times in the fourth quarter where Kyle Anderson had the basketball with the shot clock going down. I'll let you know right now, as much talent as Kyle Anderson has, as well as he has played in a few of these games, they do not want the ball in his hands with the shot clock going down. Not to create something. No, I'm telling you right now, that's not what they want. And one of those shots, like I said, he ended up making. Carl, uh, Anthony Edwards from the left side of the floor threw it to the opposite side, and, Carl, and uh, Kyle Anderson was able to make a one-legged mid-range shot at the buzzer to end the shot clock and Dallas you just live with that but that's the type of defensive performance and intensity that they played with the entire fourth quarter especially down the stretch you had a, sh a shot by Mike Conley from three that didn't go in when it was 107 and 105 late in the shot clock great performance um, in that possession there was a possession where Anthony Edwards got tied up and they had to do the jump ball that the Mavericks eventually recovering and, and, and getting the ball. That was another one. We had three or four bodies around and wrapped up. There's nowhere to go. There was another possession in that fourth quarter um, where uh, Kyle Anderson had it again, like just making them work and work and work. And I just love everything about this fourth quarter performance from the defensive um, aspect, especially without Derek Lively, the Daniel Gaffer block at the end, and then it go down with the alley hoop from Luka to, to really hammer home the victory. Incredible. In these videos that I've been doing, y'all know we go in depth. We talk about a lot of specific things, um, things that really stand out. I allow y'all to Speak y'all minds in the comments to try to, you know, solidify things that I'm seeing or even bring up things that I may not see. But the first thing that everybody's going to see, and I have the official scores report in front of me again every single quarter. That's why this little stack is thick. We don't box score watch here. But you cannot help looking at the box score and seeing that fat O of 8 from 3. Carl Anthony Towns, 14 points this game. 5 of 18 from the field, 0 of 8 from 3, 4 of 5 at the free throw line with 11 rebounds. This was a tough performance for me. And Carlton Towns, one of the most talented big men in the game right now, the, the best three-point shooting big we've seen. I just think that with his skill set and his size and his shooting ability, I think he's just too talented to go out and have an 0 of 8 performance in a game like this, man. He played 38 minutes. 38 minutes. He gave us a scoreless fourth quarter, 0 of 4 from the field, 0 of 3 from 3. And he played 11 minutes and 46 seconds of that fourth quarter. The first half, he went 0 of 5 from 3. 0 of 5 from 3. Just, to me, there has to be something in your head. There has to be somebody on that sideline that is just like, hey, enough is enough. Enough is enough. His best quarter is the third quarter. And I'm looking at the third quarter right now. He scored nine points in this quarter. Listen to this, y'all. This is the only quarter where Carthen Towns didn't attempt a three-point shot. He went three of four with three of three from the free throw line, five rebounds for nine points, and was a plus six. I, basketball is not really rocket science. And again, I just credited Dallas defense. I know what they're doing and what they're trying to do. And the defense is definitely encouraging a lot of these perimeter shots. They are. But again, we're not talking about a role player, a catch and, a catch and shoot 3 and D wing. We're talking about Carl Anthony Towns, who we've seen have monster performances. This is a dude that put up, what, 60-something points 
at a, at, a, at one of these games during the regular season. This this is this is the greatest shooting big, one of the, the most offensive polished bigs that we have in the game today. Guarded by P.J. Washington, credit to P.J. Washington, doing a really good job. But I think he's bailing out Dallas, and he's putting a lot of pressure on himself and his teammates by blindly shooting threes. And again, I understand the mentality. The next one will go in. Every great shooter, every great player has to play with that type of mentality and don't get into their head. But at some point, you also got to say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it's broke, hey, man, we got to pick up the pieces. and We got to figure something out. And it's just kind of mind blowing when you look at the course of the game and you look at the official scores report and you see his best quarter coincidentally is the same quarter where he does not attempt the three. He does not attempt the three. And that quarter is also the first quarter where Derek Lively is not playing in this game. Granted, I don't think Dwight Powell touched the floor in the fourth quarter. Um, no, he did not touch the floor in the fourth quarter. And I believe Derek, uh, Dwight Powell played, yeah, played five minutes in the third quarter. I understand that Dwight Powell being out there is a lot different and a lot more easier to do what you're trying to do versus Gafford and Lively and different things like that. But there was also a, uh, a point in this game where Dallas in the fourth quarter went extremely small. P.J. Washington played some minutes at the five. And again, I understand severely major gap defense, but you, Carl Anthony Towns, and the Minnesota Timberwolves coaching staff, y'all have to put something together where this dude isn't just sitting behind the three-point line chucking up threes damn sure if he's not going to sit up there and make any of them, if he ain't going to make any of them, then what, I mean, what are we doing? That stood out to me. Um, I will say I did like the start for, um, for Jaden McDaniels. Jaden McDaniels really came out aggressive. Uh, I think that's always good and important for this team when they can get extra buckets and extra possessions um, from their role players. And he came out, he came out aggressive. Uh, Jaden McDaniels opened up the gate with seven points, three or three from the field. And that was needed. When he was making those shots in that first quarter, I said, okay. He had one on the baseline. He was aggressive. He was putting his head down, um, getting to the cup. He made the corner three. Real, real good start to the game for Jaden McDaniels. Um, as far as Anthony Edwards goes, he ends up getting his team going, especially in that third quarter. The dunk, we all know everything that happened. And he he kind of took over the game there and brought them back to tie the game and really, I feel, swung the momentum. The dunk that he had on Daniel Gafford was one of those plays that you can see in real time the momentum swing. It was kind of refreshing to see because it's hard. You, you, you can you can understand where the momentum or hindsight, you say, oh, that's where the momentum shifted. But like in real time as a viewer who is not at the game, I'm watching through my television like the rest of y'all, and I, I think I'm almost sure a lot of y'all can agree, whether you're a Timberwolves fan or a Mavericks fan or you're indifferent like myself, you could see through the screen the momentum of the game change when he dunked on Daniel Gafford. And it was almost like playing 2K because then his mid-range shot started to go. He had a mid-range shot off the dead, and he had a mid-range shot off the bank. And it was almost like somebody who would activate their badge and it's time to take over the game. And to see that in real time was really refreshing, especially after the first half. Now, he didn't have a disgusting god off fresh ha first half or anything like that. But he, to me, this was predictable. And I was trying to tell my co-host this uh, on the last episode yesterday of Numbers on the Board, um, our podcast, which you can go check out on YouTube. Well, I was telling Derek specifically, like, hey, I saw what Anthony Edwards said and, and everything, but to me it feels like he's going to get himself in trouble by overthinking. He's already going to come out and take a lot of shots. That's no secret to anybody in the basketball world. That's the most obvious thing, and that's what should, should happen. But to me, the great players and the best players like himself, what they do is they allow the game to come to them, and they know I don't have to force anything because I'm always going to be good. Whether I'm making shots, missing shots, first half, second half, I'm going to figure it out. I have to let the game organically come to me and play through that way. But when you come in there with a predetermined mindset and a predetermined mentality of saying, like he said in the post game or the, the pregame of like, man, you're going to see a lot of shots. That just doubled down on me saying, oh, man, this might be this, 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 this could get ugly. Because if you come in predetermined that way. When you're already going to get a bunch of shots, like like I said, you've already you've been that's your role. There's no need to really double down on it. You know what I mean? And then he was saying with the gap defense, hey, maybe a good shot is just me taking that contested shot. And again, this just goes all into the psyche of a number one option, which is a bonus for Dallas, because now when the gaps is closed. 
He's now is thinking twice on kicking it out. He's hesitant on the shot he wants to take. Am I pump faking? Am I going straight up? Is it contest? You know what I mean? And now those are low percentage shots for any player. And when you begin to miss them, you may begin to get frustrated with yourself and start to then what we call press. And when you start pressing, you start to do things that you saw him do. Like in his first half, he had three turnovers. He had three turnovers because he wasn't sure of himself and how he wanted to attack things. I always think that first options, you have to be aggressive. But I also think you have to play within the flow of the game, especially when you are that guy like him, like Luka. I think Kyrie has done a very good job of it in this in this playoff run. Sometimes he's done too much of it where he's trying to let the game come to him too much. And a few of us watch the game like Kyrie, brother, you got to get going. You know what I mean? Like, come on now. Um, But sometimes you got to make that pass. Even if you don't want to, even if it's a guy who hasn't made a shot or has been struggling in the playoffs, Early on, you make that pass. You let the defense know that you're willing to make that pass. Maybe your teammate make an early shot or two like Jaden McDaniels. You know what I mean? Maybe you get them going and now you got some help. But as long as you play within the floor of the game, you kind of leave yourself unpredictable. But when you press and press and out of the gate, shoot and shoot and shoot, and now I'm in the air. Oh, shit, they contested it better than I thought. I don't know what to do. I'm throwing the ball away. I'm dribbling to double teams. I'm dribbling to no man's land with no plan except I'm just going to attack and be aggressive. Now you start to see yourself turn the ball over. There's no rhythm for you. There's no rhythm for your teammates. There's a lack of confidence. It's it's all it's all a point of the game. And I felt like some of those possessions happened early on where you were able to see that in the first half specifically. Same thing with Carlton Towns, to a lesser degree because he don't control the basketball as much. But again, man, two of ten and half of the shots are from three with two free throw attempts. Just not acceptable. And again, for the Maverick side, like I said in the last video when they won in game two, those games that they lost, Minnesota at home, they really stung because Dallas didn't shoot the ball great. And in that last game, specifically game two, Derrick Jones, Jury, and P.J. Washington combined for 0 of 7 from 3. 0 of 7 from 3. In the first half, they knocked that out of the water. In the first half, they combined for 4 of 7. That fast. That was the most predictable thing in the world. Role players play better at home. And these two dudes were nowhere nowhere near going to shoot as bad. Now, with that I know Derrick Jones Jr. was going to make three threes in the first half. No, I did not. I did not expect that or know that or see that coming. I just knew he wasn't going to be threeless and missing every single three that he shot. Same thing with uh with, with, with P.J. Washington. The biggest thing for Dallas, though, was the loss of Derek Lively. And again, just like the other games, to see them be able to overcome that because the impact he had on the game early was the biggest first-half thing for me. Obviously, it's always good to see Luka going, and Luka went 5 of 12 with 15 points. Kyrie had another 14. That's 29 points combined in the first half um, on 10 of 22 shooting. Of course, that stands out. But Derek Lively, you can't even tell by the box score because the box score say Derek Lively got six points and three rebounds, right? But we know the short roll passing difference between him and Gafford. I think that's evident. Not only the passing, but just the decision and the the approach. Daniel Gafford, I, it's like I would love to be on the coaching staff and just let Daniel Gafford know and show him some film. Like, we won, but look. When you get the ball right here, even if you can't make the read as fast, as quick, or as precise as Derek Lively, you don't have to be in a rush. It's like a lot of times Derek Lively get that ball in that same short roll spot, and he panics to where he doesn't see the read as fast, and he just goes. He just goes, 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 goes immediately before allowing anything to process. And I think if he just takes his time and he doesn't panic, something is going to open up. He'll have somebody to dish it to, or he'll see it, or you'll get Derrick Jones Jr. baseline cut or something. But he's just too fast. It's just he just goes so much, and I think that it, it puts him in a tough spot. I think in his last, in the maybe in the fourth quarter or the third quarter, there was a possession where he had it on a short roll, and he was he caught it immediately and attacked. Rudy was there, took that away, and he had to kind of throw the ball out to the left corner to Derrick Jones Jr. or somebody in the air, and that's just not a pass you want to see Derrick Gafford make. But he rushed. If he didn't rush, he would have never allowed himself to get in the air and have to make a, a decision. And that's why um, they miss Derek Lively a lot because Derek Lively is active on that glass. Um, they both are, but he's just relentless. He also had the two assists because he can make the reads. And even in the, the, the times he didn't get an assist accredited for it, 
He just knows how to be calm um, and knows how to be present and not allow the Minnesota Timberwolves to speed him up to make something, you know, uh, make a mistake that he's going to regret. And I like that from Derek Lively a lot. And, um, you know, his shot blocking. His, Gafford can shot block too, but having two of those guys back to back uh, in and out for each other is just like one of the greatest um, tools that Jason Kidd has because we saw the difference when Dwight Powell was in the game. When Dwight Powell played his five minutes in that third quarter, you saw the difference in the rim protection and the the intimidation. The Timberwolves was like, oh, okay, that's who's back there. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. We attacking. And the third quarter, I, I just want to I want to fact check really, really quick. And I want to see the third quarter where my guy Powell played. The Timberwolves scored 12 points in the paint that quarter. I want to do my homework and see. Okay, so they they scored 12 points in the paint as well um, in the fourth quarter. The biggest thing that stood out for me, too, <clears throat> in the third quarter was the free throw discrepancy. Now, I'm not here to say that that was the blame. I'm not saying that's why they lost. But anytime you see a team take 17 free throws and the other team takes three, you, you bat an eye at that. You look at that closely. Now, for me to figure out what's the real problem with that, I'll have to rewatch the game. I have to rewatch the quarter and really get a feel for what's going on. I see that Lucas shot eight free throws in a quarter, which he outshot the, the the Minnesota Timberwolves by himself. Another four free throws for P.J. Washington. I don't know if this is a, a whistle of being aggressive. I don't know if this is a lack of calls from the Timberwolves. I, there were a few plays where I felt like the Timberwolves may have got you know some and ones. That was a Kyle Anderson floater. I felt like he got fouled on. The Nas Reed dunk, I feel like P.J. Washington kind of tapped him on the head in that one just off the top of my brain. Um, again, I don't like to make a prejudgment just talking out of my ass or, or looking at a box score, but this is a very big discrepancy, specifically in the third quarter. Um, it's a, it was lopsided the entire game, but it's going to be lopsided whenever you have a quarter where another team shoots 14 more free throws. To end the game, the Minnesota Timberwolves attempted 17 free throws and Dallas shot 31. Um, so again, 14 free throw disparity there. Both teams left five, three point, I mean, five free throws at the line. Um, but yeah, this was, I seen this coming a mile away, man. I seen this coming a mile away. I said it in the video after game two, you're going to have a game where these guys are going to be able to knock the three ball down. They shot 50% in this game from three. They went 14 of 28. They got 31 free throw attempts. Um, and they, they won this game while having 14 turnovers. They had a lot of careless turnovers in this game. Kyrie specifically, dribbling the ball out of bounds and different things like that. Not used to seeing that from Kyrie. But one thing I will say about Kyrie Irving, anytime he makes a mistake like that, dribbling off the dribbling off his foot and going out of bounds or missing a free throw, missing two free throws, I feel like he is going to come back and make up for it. Like, that's just been Kyrie this entire series. And, like, every time Kyrie does something, I'm like, Kyrie, what are you doing? That's not you, brother. Like, you missing free throws? He'll come back and make a, a tough mid-range jumper over Rudy. You know what I'm saying? Or Kyrie, you missed the two free throws down the stretch in game two, but then he goes and makes the left side corner three-point shot. That was huge for them. So um, Kyrie Irving, he, he's, he's been phenomenal. 66 points combined for your two best players. And then to also get 27 points from two of your most uh, crucial role players with the impact that the bigs had, they're not going to lose a game in this series. This is going to be a sweep. If they are if they are continuing to get this type of production, they're going to finish a job um, on Tuesday with a sweep, man, with a sweep. Especially on the other side, when again Carlton Towns is he's getting outscored by Jaden McDaniels. That's that's never that's never good, man. Jaden McDaniels outscored him with ten less shots. He went six of eight. Tat, cat five of eighteen. They got to find a way to gap it up. What I did love early for Minnesota though was not having. Anthony Edwards dominated the basketball and tire himself out. Um, there was also a play where you saw him come off almost like an Iverson cut or something like that, and he ended up making a mid-range jump shot over Luka Doncic. That was in the first half, I believe. Seeing him have some plays and some action where they actually are calling a play for him and he can play within the floor of the offense and not just try to create for himself constantly. We understand uh, Anthony Edwards is going to create shots. He's going to have the basketball and different things like that. But you have to try to generate him, Minnesota, as many easy buckets as you can within the floor of the game. 
right? Like that's the name of the game. Who can score as many easy baskets as possible? And then when you need to down the stretch, you get your heroics. So that third quarter performance he had when he started to cook and it felt like he got his mom a takeover badge or whatever, then you let him cook. But there was just a lot of a, a lot of plays where they had some sets, and I was like, oh, I, I, I kind of like that. And then, you know, they got away from that, I feel like, a lot. And you had another good performance from Nas Reed off of that bench. They're going to have to make a decision. Nas Reed going 5 of 10, 14 points, um, kind of being better than Carlton Towns. You got to make a decision. Um Rudy only played two minutes in the fourth quarter. He didn't even play 30 minutes in this game. That's going to be a talking point. I'm telling you right now, the defensive player of the year playing two minutes in the fourth quarter while his team is out there getting cooked because how much did Dallas score in the fourth quarter? Let's see. They had 33 in the first quarter. Then they scored 27 in the second. Then they had 27 in the third. And then in the fourth quarter, they had 29. So, yeah, um, Two minutes and 47 seconds for Rudy. Only, what, only one foul, I think, it looked like he had. So, it wasn't foul trouble. A um, lot of lot of questions. A lot of questions. Uh, oh, no, he had five fouls. I'm sorry. He had five fouls. But at that point, who cares? They strategically sh- uh, sat him down so they could switch everything. And I, I, I'm not mad at them for that decision. But that will be a conversation. And I... I did it last video when I talked about the Pacers and Nimhard stepping up and, you know, you're going to have to pay him eventually and, and things can get murky there. Hey, listen, Crosby Towns, if he, if, man, I don't want to say it, but Nas Reed, Nas Reed does not make Crosby Towns untradeable. They cannot. The way Carl Anthony Towns has shot in this series, man, and I wish I had the number in front of me. I'm on NBA.com right now because I had to print out some of these uh, some of these stats. I would just love to see. I'm going to view the series real quick, y'all, in real time. We're not going to cut this or anything either. I just want to see the series in real time. Can I see stats? I see stats. Bear with me. I'm so sorry. This is uns- This is off the top, not scripted. But I just want to know specifically, and they don't even have the game three numbers up yet. Let's see. Let's see how these numbers look without even taking account the the game three performance. Carnegie Towns is shooting twenty seven percent from the field. He's also shooting twenty one percent from three. With fifteen points, he's a negative two and a half on a plus minus. It's not good, man. And then you have Nas Reed coming off the bench playing twenty eight minutes, and he's shooting. 59% from the field, 67% from three. Obviously, these numbers are extremely inflated for Nas Reed because he had such an incredible shooting game in game seven. But he's been big. Without Nas Reed in this series or having these performances, these games are not even close. And I get it. It's politics. Carlton Towns make a lot of money. He's your second best player. He's been there the longest. This is, like, so good for him. But Dallas is going to have to continue to make decision after decision um, in game four because Carson Towns cannot come out and shoot like t- dog 20. I know these stats are inflated, but even with the inflation of these stats, 27 percent is insane. And then it ain't going to get no better with five of 18 and all eight from three. If you are shooting 21 percent from three and then we add in the all of eight performance here, dog, this is about to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly. And they're not going to go into, I'm telling you, they're not about to be going into the second apron and paying all of this money. And they get to this, they get this far. This was their time. We talk about it a lot when you talk about vets and, and different players who play in the league. And they always talk about how they get far or they get to the finals. And you just know, you just know you're going to be back. And then before you know it, you blink nine years past and you've never been back. You never got another chance. So. I'm not trying to put anything in the air for Minnesota Timberwolves fans, but these are the type of performances that teams and organizations, they they look at. We are in a reaction world. What have you done for me lately? That's why a guy like Bruce Brown can have a playoff run with Denver. They win a championship, and he goes and makes $20, $20 million the very next following offseason because what have you done for me lately? It's not about what he projected, not about, no. Boom, we want him. He just had a good playoffs. We want him. <laughs> You know what I mean? 
That's why the Clippers are in a position that they're in. They haven't been able to get it done. So now it's like, hey, do we want to play Paul George? You got a team like Philly, like, hey, shit, we'll take him. We want something new. It's going to be interesting. Um, Other things that stood out for me, just off the top of my brain, love the possession where Jaden Hardy had Rudy Gobert on him. He looked at Luka, threw the ball back to Luka. Luka looked back at him like, bro, if you don't go, t- if you don't go at him, that is the type of shit that I love to see. Luka also took a charge in his game. That's the type of shit I love to see. Um, I think P.J. Washington had a really good bounce back game where he was very particular on what he was doing, right? I felt like in the first two games, there were certain possessions and certain plays where he didn't really seem sure of himself, and he, he ended up messing up more by trying to do too much. Too many times where I see him dribble into two seven-footers or lose the ball or have a silly turnover. And again, he's human. He's a player. Those type of things happen. Um, but on a night like tonight, zero turnover, 16 points, two of six from three. The ones that he hit were big, got to that free throw line, six rebounds. Really, really good performance, man, 50% from the field. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Great, great, great minutes from him. Um, Josh Green, he he made the only shot he took, which was a big three. He always seems to find a way to make a big three, but he also had two big – or no, one big offensive rebound. I remember that rebound specifically. He ran and got it and chased it. And, again, those are just the impact plays. And um, 25 minutes, he, he was able to, to impact the game. I love what Jason Kidd is doing with this team defensively. Um, I can't wait to see it in the NBA Finals. There's never been a team that has lost a 3-0 lead. So um, anything is possible. It's not over until they win four for sure. But I have to start thinking as an analyst about them matching up with the Boston Celtics. It's looking like it's going to be a Dallas Maverick versus Boston Celtics. And that's going to be must-see must TV, man. Kyrie back in the, the TD Garden with that history there. Luka Doncic potentially being able to win his first ring on that stage. The legacy. Jason Tate. Oh, man. This is... Oh, oh man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I will say I did <clears throat> I did predict Dallas to win this series on numbers on the board. But I thought this was going to be a lot closer. And it's... I mean, it still can. Jason Tatum and the, the Boston Celtics, they keep reminding us that they... We're down th- uh, 3-0 last year and took it to game seven. So, for sure, this, this again, the series is not over at all. Um, but, again, when you have so many wasted performances from your complementary players, it's hard for me to find a way for you to win because Dallas has keyed in on not allowing Anthony Edwards to have some 45-point performance. Um, Jaden McDaniels' monster performance in game one went to waste. Nas Reed performance in game two went to waste. You get a game like tonight where you have somebody like Mike Conley come and give you four of seven from three with 16 points. Go to waste. Go to waste. 24 bench points, 27 bench points, uh, 24 between Kyle Anderson and Nas Reed. That outscores um, Dallas's bench, which gave you what, uh, 10, 16, 18. 27 points to 18. Um Nas Reed almost outscored the bench by himself again. So, yeah, when you're wasting these performances, I, that's what I want to end the video with. That's the question. I'm going to try to end, end, the, end all of these videos with questions. How do the Timberwolves get a win? We've seen a Jaden McDaniels performance. We have seen Nas Reed performance. We've seen Anthony Edwards do as best, as best as he can. This performance that he had in the third quarter was incredible. This was this was magnificent they had help again from mcdaniels they had help again from mike conley they had a, a 11 point quarter from kyle anderson in game one was that 11 or was that seven 11 and a half i don't know but you're getting kyle anderson double digit performances uh the mavericks we've seen two games where they didn't shoot the three ball well now they're at home and shoot like how do you win how do you win a game as always i'm pb the plug this is the pb the plug channel you want to make sure you're locked in here all playoffs long as much as uh like always, I, I truly appreciate y'all, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow for Boston potentially closing that out and going to the NBA Finals. So, yeah, Dallas fans, y'all up. I'll see y'all next time. I'm out. Peace.